Concerns of long-term PPI scare away patients who would benefit from their use. Let's discuss the data and the reasons that many of these concerns are unfounded. There are four main concerns with the long-term use of PPIs. Those are the absorption of key vitamins and minerals, the risk for infections, interactions with other important medications, and links to long-term chronic conditions like dementia and kidney disease. That's a lot to talk about, so let's tackle the first two in this video and soon I'll cover the other two. Many TikTok quacks claim that various vitamin deficiencies are the roots of all of your ails and that if you were to stop taking a PPI, you'd be relieved of these. And on the surface, this makes some sense as the stomach acidity is key in the absorption of things like iron, magnesium. It also plays a critical role in the absorption of B12. And there's the concern of calcium absorption and how it affects our bone health. Each of these minerals and vitamins is partially dependent on acid to help release them from our food and make them maximally available for absorption. But thankfully, our small intestine has a massive absorptive capacity. Its surface area rivals a tennis court. It's more than enough to make do and still get an adequate amount of these vitamins and minerals in from our diet. In many ways, our diet is probably more rich in these minerals and vitamins than they were for our ancestors. And so we actually probably have an excess capacity and ability to absorb them. And in our modern diet, we very often have more than enough. That said, some of these vitamin and mineral levels may drop slightly with long-term use, but it's not just the strength of the association, it's the size of the effect that matters. And the size of the effect proves to not be very large. In fact, GI societies state that there's really no need for patients to routinely supplement these minerals and vitamins or even monitor their levels with the long-term use of a PPI. In other words, they're telling us that the preponderance of evidence states that we really don't need to worry about that. The big question though may be, what is the impact on calcium absorption? Because this is a special concern for women past menopause that they're at risk of decreased bone density. Again, it doesn't really seem like this is key. And if you have a diet that's rich in calcium and vitamin D, then you're probably going to be just fine. Isn't our stomach meant to be very acidic to help cleanse our food and rid it of bacteria that would otherwise enter our system? Yes, that's true. And there is strong data to suggest that there is an increased risk of GI infections with the long-term use of PPIs, including Clostridium difficile. But what's the magnitude of the fact? It's very small. And so this is not really a meaningful risk for the vast majority of patients. If you're a patient who's had recurrent C. diff, then yes, maybe you should try to get off of a PPI. If you're a patient who has cirrhosis and ascites, then yes, you should probably try to reduce a PPI to minimize the risk of developing spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. But these are select patient populations and it does not apply to the vast majority of patients because ultimately the effect size is very small. Why is that? Well, because thankfully our body didn't just rely on stomach acid to ward off bacteria. We have a host of immune systems that will fend off bacteria. An amazing fact, if you load the liver up with millions of bacteria, guess how many will make it out to the other side into your circulatory system? A healthy liver is able to fend off tons of bacteria, and it really is one of the cores of our immune system. So it really doesn't even matter if you have a leaky gut because your liver is ultimately gonna take care of the rest. So why make all this stomach acid if it's not really needed? Comparative biology suggests that our stomach acid is actually more on par with scavenger species. That means that your great grandfather times 4,000 was probably picking up scraps after a saber-toothed tiger. We were eating rancid meat, and today, I hope that you don't. Today, we are apex predators, and if we look at the stomach acid of something like a lion, its stomach acid seems to be lower because they're eating fresh meat. And I hope that you are too, fresh cooked meat. Now, against all of that, ultimately, the side effects of any medication are gonna be minimized by minimizing the dose that you take. And if you're having acid reflux, this is about controlling symptoms unless you have one of the chronic conditions that I've spoken about in other videos. 
It's also worth considering what are your alternatives to medical therapy. And in other videos, I discuss the lifestyle measures and the surgical considerations that may help a person who has reflux disease. The point is, you don't have to take a PPI. And so you should do it when the benefit exceeds the risk. But I also don't want you to believe that the long-term risks are really dire. The other thing that's important to emphasize is that if you're not having any benefit of your reflux symptoms, then it's possible that you don't actually have acid reflux. You may have a completely separate condition, one that a GI doctor can help you diagnose and get on more appropriate treatment for. Because certainly there's no reason to take a PPI if it's not benefiting you. Then you're really only gonna have its potential side effects. If you have severe symptoms, you could lead a life of austerity and subsist on porridge alone, or you could take a PPI and indulge a little. That's what I would do. And in a separate video, I'm gonna discuss some of the other chronic conditions and worries that arise for the long-term use of a PPI. For now, thank you for watching and be safe.